Well, welcome back to the second part of our axial skeleton tour. And so last time we finished off with the skull and the hyoid and the auditory ossicles. And now we're going to take a look at the vertebral column, the ribs, and the sternum. And so as where we looked at uh, 22 bones in the skull and six auditory ossicles and one hyoid, now we're going to look at the 24 ribs and the 26 vertebrae and the one sternum. So um, when we look at your vertebral column, there's 26 bones. So I always think there's 26 vertebrae, just like there's 26 letters in the alphabet. And they're broken down by region. So we have a cervical, thoracic, lumbar, sacrum, and coccyx. And so an easy way to remember this, if you look at the numbers, we say you have breakfast at 7, lunch at 12, dinner at 5, and then you have one sacrum and one coccyx. So let's take a look at these uh, bones. So here's our vertebral column. And so you can see up here in the neck, these are cervical vertebrae one through seven. And they're named C1, C2, C3, so forth, um, all the way down onto C7. And what we find out about these vertebrae, these are the thinnest of the, of the uh, vertebrae in the entire body. They are short, they are thin, they are not very heavy because they carry very little weight. And what you'll notice with the cervical vertebrae too, uh, is that the C1 and C2 have special names. So C1 we call the atlas, and we talked about this in the last video, it's the bone that holds up your skull, and the axis is C2, which allows the atlas and the skull to pivot like when you shake your head now. Other than that, the other ones are just known by their regular cervical 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7 names. Uh, if you notice the curvature of the cervical region, you'll notice that it is kind of concave. So um, like looking from the posterior uh, direction, it's a concavity. And if you look at a fetal skeleton, so here's how your skeleton looked as a fetus. Your entire spine looked like a big letter C. And you know, this is your little tail bud down here. And so what happens is from fetal development up until adulthood, we see some changes in the curvature. So when you were born, you notice, uh, like you'll notice with babies, we usually hold them with their head kind of pointed back towards their umbilicus. So we always hold them in this direction because this is the shape of their spine. At a certain point, their spine actually starts to turn and we form number one here, which is our cervical curvature. And so this forms uh, about the time that a baby can support its head and hold its head up by itself. Uh, the second region, which is in blue here, this is the thoracic curvature. And so over here, we have one through 12. These are the thoracic vertebrae. And the thoracic vertebrae, they maintain the same convex shape when facing from the posterior. And this stays uh, consistent throughout life. The thoracic vertebrae are named T1 through T12. And what we find out about these is that these are special because they all support a pair of ribs. So there's 12 pairs of ribs to go with the 12 thoracic vertebrae. Uh, inferior to that, we find the lumbar vertebrae, and we have five of these. These are named L1 through L5. This is this green region of our fetus, and here's the green region in our body. And you'll notice that, once again, we have a change in the curvature. And so about the time that kids start to crawl and walk, when they start to get mobile near the um, probably about six to nine months uh, after they're born, this curvature starts to change, and this allows us to stand upright and support our body's weight. So we're actually born with a C-shaped spine, and we evolved to have this kind of like curly spine. Anyway, the lumbar region, these are the largest and heaviest vertebrae. Uh, they're under the most strain and stress because they are the most inferior. They carry all the upper body's weight with no other bony support. So uh, they're pretty important. This is where most people have back problems. So if you know people that have a bad back, if they have a herniated disc or a slipped disc, Generally, this is going to be a problem in the lumbar region uh, because when you carry things, especially if you're overweight, you carry a lot of pressure on these little intervertebral discs, and that's where you start to have problems. Okay, just inferior to the lumbar vertebrae, we have this bone down here, which is our sacrum, and we'll take a look at that in a minute, but it forms uh, part of our um, pelvis. And then down here at the very bottom, the most inferior of our bones, in the vertebral column is the coccyx. And the coccyx is, of course, your tailbone. And we'll take a look at that in a minute. So here is a view of a typical vertebra. This is a lumbar vertebra in this case. And we're looking at this from the superior aspect. So we're looking inferiorly down at the top of this vertebra. 
And so we see it's got a few really important parts. The first part is this big section up here on the front uh, that makes up most of the mass of the vertebra. This is what's called the body or the centrum. So usually we call this the vertebral body or the centrum. And this, of course, contains most of the bone mass. This is where the inter intervertebral disc will rest, so it sits right on here. And this is the part that bears most of the body's weight. Behind that, we have this region that we call the vertebral arch. And what we find the vertebral arch does is it kind of goes around this big hollow space in the middle, and this hollow space is called the vertebral foramen. And this is the passageway for the spinal cord and the spinal nerves. Uh, connected onto the vertebral arch, we see a couple other parts. There's a little guy that sticks out here. This is called a transverse process. There's another one over on this side, and they get that name because they stick out in the transverse direction. Uh, we also have another process that sticks out back here posteriorly, and this little guy, well, it's actually pretty big. This is called our spinous process, and this is the part that we normally think of as our spine because uh, it protrudes posteriorly, and you can actually feel this through your skin. So if you, uh, you know, palpate the back, uh, the skin on your dorsal region, you can actually feel this. A couple other little parts here. We have, these are articular facets. These uh, form joints between the vertebrae, and there's a superior set, and there's an inferior set that we can't see here, but it'll be on the other side of the vertebral arch. Here's a good look at our sacrum and cockpit. So these are just modified vertebrae. So the sacrum is actually made of one, two, three, four, five fused vertebrae. Uh, you notice they've got a hollow tube, so there's our vertebral foramen. Uh, we have little holes, and these foramina, these little holes are to allow nerves to exit. They go down into your legs and lower back. And then here's our coccyx, or our tailbone. And this is really interesting. It's a little vestigial bone here. Uh, so this is the remnants of what our tailbones would be if we actually had tails. And if you notice, it's actually made of four parts. Some people only have three sections, some people have four, some people have five, but most of us have four. That's the most common setup. And um, it really doesn't do too much. There's a couple of bones that are anchored onto this, and that's why we still need it. So you actually do need your tailbone, believe it or not. So let's take a look at the rib cage for a minute here. Um, when we look at the ribs, if you remember, I said that there were 12 thoracic vertebrae, and there's 12 pairs of ribs. So you can see here would be our T1, and here are the ribs connected to T1. T2, 3, 4, so on, all the way down to 12. And so when we look at the ribs, we break them down to a couple different classes. Uh, if you notice, rib pair 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, and 7 all have a direct cartilage connection to the sternum. So this is our breastbone or the sternum. And so you can see we have a direct hyaline cartilage connection right here. There's a second one for 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 as its own that kind of borders on 7. And then seven comes up here and connects on at the very bottom. Those are considered the true ribs. So rib pairs one through seven are our true ribs. If you look down at pairs number eight, nine, and ten, they all kind of like piggyback onto seven. So they all kind of have this cartilage that piggybacks onto the cartilage of the seventh pair of ribs and then goes on to the sternum. We consider these to be false ribs. So eight, nine, and ten are false. Eleven and twelve don't connect at all, and they're also considered false ribs. So we have a grand total of five false ribs, 8 through 12. Then, if you look, 11 and 12, because they don't connect at all, they're a special class of false ribs that we call floating ribs, because they have no connection at all to the sternum. They just have a little tiny bit of cartilage at the very end. Uh, the sternum, if you look at it, this is our breastbone. And the sternum has a couple different parts. It actually starts off as uh, a couple separate bones. This part up at the top, the superior part, is called the manubrium. And there's this line right here, right about where the second pair of ribs joins. And this is the dividing line from where the manubrium was once a separate bone when you were a child. And then this is what we call the body of the sternum. And so this was its own separate bone. And then down here at the bottom, there's this little tiny patch of cartilage that we call the xiphoid process. And so throughout most of your life, this is cartilage. It slowly ossifies and turns into bone as you get older. Sometimes it has a little hole in it, as they show here. Sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes it's bifurcated, which means it's got like a left and a right fork. Sometimes it's just solid. Uh, but basically what we see with the, uh, the sternum here, the breastbone, it links all the ribs together to form the rib cage. So it kind of anchors them on the anterior uh, portion here. Uh, it actually has a couple little facets up here. There's like a tiny little indentation on each side. And actually your collarbones hook onto this. So this is actually where your collarbones hook onto 
the axial skeleton right there. And the ribs, believe it or not, can actually move. They actually lift up and down, kind of like bucket handles when you breathe. So when you take a deep breath and you puff your chest down, these actually rotate and lift your sternum and increase the uh, space inside your chest. Okay, so we're all done with looking at the bones. A couple little things to look at are the uh, landmarks, as we call them, or bone markings. Uh, these are broken down to a few classes, the first one being depressions or openings. A really common one we see is what's called a foramen. Uh, that's singular, the plural for this is foramina. And so a foramen is just like a small hole, uh, it's like a little tunnel through a bone that usually carries some sort of tubes. Like So it'll carry like a blood vessel, nerves, um, rarely you'll have a ligament that'll go through one. Uh, but generally these are holes that puncture through a bone all the way to the central part of the bone, the hollow inside, which is known as the uh, medullary cavity. And so basically this allows um, you know, material to pass through the bone. Uh, a meatus is quite a bit larger and uh, longer, more like a tube than a foramen. So it's more of a tube than a hole. And the main one that we talk about here is of course the external auditory meatus that extends from your ear through your temporal bone uh, to allow you to hear. Uh, fossa is just a little depression. Usually these are for muscles, so usually like a muscle attached here. You have a, a temporal fossa, which is on your temporal bone and onto your parietal bones, uh, where your um, chewing muscles exist on the side of the skull. And then of course a notch uh, is just like kind of more of a sharp depression. It's like a cutout in a bone uh, that allows blood vessels or nerves to pass through. Okay, so um, when we look at the ends of bones where they form joints, there's a couple different ways that uh, these can form. A condyle is like the rounded end of a bone. So if you think of like a dog bone, these are those kind of like two rounded parts that stick out. And so um, we see a couple condyles, for example, like if you look right next to the foramen magnum, there were two rounded processes there that connect the skull to the, um, to the atlas. And so those are the uh, condyles of the skull. Uh, some bones have what's called a head, which is a special type of condyle where it's very round, spherical almost. And then it usually narrows down to a neck below that. And we see a lot of these like in the shoulder and in the hip joints. Uh, a facet is where we have like a smooth part where two bones come in contact with each other. So if you look at your vertebrae, they form some facets which allow them to kind of glide and have a slight movement back and forth relative to each other. Uh, a couple other things that we see, we see processes, and these processes are parts that like stick out. They're kind of like bumps on the bones. Uh, the largest of these, or the most common of these, I guess you'd say, would be a tuberosity. And uh, tuberosity always reminds me of like potatoes because they're tubers, uh, but they're just kind of like a, you know, a widening or a projection that allows a muscle to attach. And so what you find out is muscles exert force on bones, Therefore, the bones widen to um, resist that force so that they don't break. Uh, we have some spines, and the spine is just uh, basically a pointy part that sticks out from the bone to connect a muscle. There's a, a couple trochanters in your hip, and they're just like very large tuberosities, and um, they're just extra large, basically, tuberosities. Uh, we see crests, too. Uh, there are quite a few of these in the body, and this is basically... Um, if you think of like the top of a rooster's head, it's got that crest that sticks up. Uh, it's kind of like that. So some bones have like a border or a ridge that sticks up and allows muscles to attach to it. And then the last one is called an epicondyle. And these are always connected to a condyle. And they are just above the condyle. So they're right, you know, very close to the end of the bone near a joint. And they allow muscles to attach in that region. Congratulations, you survived all the way to the end. So hopefully now you know everything you need to know about the axial skeleton. If you have any questions, you can ask me or go back and watch one of our videos. Thanks for watching.